I predict that in 70 years, it will no longer be possible for a company to buy a list of people who suffer from AIDS or Alzheimer's. It will no longer be possible to buy a list of people who suffer from depression or impotence. It will no longer be possible to buy a list of victims of sexual assault. But we will reach a crisis point well before then. Today, my mission is simple. I want to explain how pervasive data surveillance creates disadvantage for each of us individually and threatens our society as a whole. Why the law currently lets this happen and what needs to change. Most of you will be aware that you now have a number of surveillance devices in your lives. You probably have one in your pocket, maybe one on your wrist, on your kitchen counter, in your car. They track where you go, what you buy, what embarrassing symptoms you Google, what you like, what you read, how hard you exercise, what you eat, what you earn and what you worry about. Those last two may be the same thing. What's happening with all that information? If we go to the privacy policies, we get the comforting messages. We care about your privacy. We never sell your data. If we want to know what's really going on, we need to go beyond the privacy policies. Cameron Marlowe, who led Facebook's data science team, explained it this way. He said, for the first time, we have a microscope that not only lets us examine social behaviour at a very fine level that we've never been able to see before, but allows us to run experiments that millions of users are exposed to at once. In 2017, the Australian newspaper got hold of a leaked document that showed that Facebook was able to monitor the posts, pictures and internet activities of 6.4 million young Australians and New Zealanders in real time to work out when they felt worthless, defeated, anxious, stupid, a failure. When this was revealed, Facebook said this was an internal error. Facebook also made errors that led to the personal information of over 50 million users being sold to a political consulting company for psychological profiling, apparently used to aid in the election of President Trump. Why this intense interest in us? Why does your bank want access to your social media posts? Why does your frequent flyer club want to know when you're exercising and where? Why is Google searching us well beyond our Google searches? No doubt you know these companies use our information to sell ads. Last year, Facebook made over 55 billion US dollars in ad revenue. Google made $116 billion in ad revenue. But to make those billions, these companies need to be able to predict our future behaviour very accurately. This business of prediction is so profitable that Microsoft scientists have said even an increase in the accuracy of prediction of 0.1% can create hundreds of millions of extra dollars in revenue for a company. And to do this, they will take all the personal data they can get. Two more things are needed to make this a success. First, they need to make the tracking hidden to avoid creeping you out. Next, they need to make their services addictive. The hidden tracking is already well in train. Technology is constantly evolving to ensure that you cannot stop your phone acting as a location device, to ensure that you cannot avoid being tracked as you move around the web. 
Google and others are working with governments to construct entire smart cities filled with connected sensors to monitor and report on our every move. And it's not just the tech giants. Others have created toys that transmit our kids' conversations online, televisions that record our conversations in the home. There are even plans for a smart vodka bottle that would send information about our consumption back to the supplier. How could that go wrong? <laughs> The second requirement is that the service should be addictive so that you'll spend more time on the site and reveal more information about yourself. You know how this addiction works. First, you need to build your followers and most importantly, make sure you have more followers than your friends. Next come the likes. One app developer said, likes are our generation's crack cocaine. To get those likes, you need to spend more time there, working out what to post next, what photo to upload, and when. That's before we come to YouTube, also owned by Google. You just jump on there to check out a BBC report for your history assignment, and next thing you know, you've spent four hours of your life watching Chuck Norris videos. We know this is happening. But does it really matter? Last year, I was on the radio one night talking about digital health records. It was actually very late at night, so I was pretty sure my mum was the only one listening. But it turned out there were at least two people listening because a lady phoned into the station and said, you know, I don't have a problem if the government wants to put my medical record in an online database. I've got nothing to hide. If someone out there wants to know about my glaucoma, they can be my guest. Was she right? If we can just get used to being tracked every moment of the day, will it all be OK? Who are the casualties in this always-on surveillance? Behind the scenes, our online data is combined and aggregated with other information about our lives, online and offline, to reveal sensitive information about us. Information we may not know ourselves and that won't be shown to us. Our likelihood of suffering from certain diseases, our mental health, our emotional state. Researchers are working with Microsoft on technology that would reveal whether we are developing Parkinson's disease based on our online scrolling and clicking patterns. Health insurers will increasingly make it compulsory to have access to our wearable devices, to track our diet, our exercise, our medications. These wearable devices are evolving into implantables that we will swallow to monitor our health from the inside out. The effects are most devastating for those who are already the most vulnerable. Those with low incomes or the wrong ethnic background those with chronic illnesses or unfashionable personality traits. But these ranks and scores, the decisions to exclude or discriminate, will affect us all. Will it be your child who is denied a job or a home because emotion analytics determined that they were too often disappointed, too rarely open or content? Will it be your grandchild who is denied insurance before they are even born based on information, genetic information revealed by their grandparents? Will there be any inner spaces left? Spaces which are vital to us individually and as a society if we are to benefit from creativity and innovation, dissent and debate. People often assume that governments or the law would stop our information being used against us. 
but governments and political parties are driving the demand for our personal data as well, not least to determine who will support their party, who would support their party if they were shown a different message, who might cause trouble and who will be compliant. The law currently assumes that privacy policies are giving us real information and real notice and choice about how our data is used. Last year, two researchers made news when they published a study titled The Biggest Lie on the Internet. They wanted to see how much attention we pay to online privacy policies and terms of use. So they set up a pretend social networking service and had over 500 American undergraduates sign up for that service. The result was that less than 2% of the students realised that in the process they had agreed under Clause 2.3.1 to give their firstborn child to the social media company. The point of this study was to show how poorly we do at reading online terms of use. According to the researchers, the biggest lie on the internet is that we keep ticking the box that says, I agree to these terms and conditions. But that's not the biggest lie on the internet. The biggest lie on the internet is that we as individuals have the power, the resources, and the information necessary to bargain with Google and Facebook, with Amazon and Uber, with Microsoft and Netflix about what they can do with our personal information. The companies driving this data collection have unprecedented power and unprecedented knowledge. They are determined to protect the billions of dollars they make monitoring our every move and they have lived by mottos that give little comfort. Move fast and break things. Do first, ask forgiveness later. If you go down to the foyer of our law school, you'll see a sign on the wall, a message from our first dean, Hal Wooten. He believed that as lawyers, we should have a keen concern for those on whom the law bears harshly. The law bears harshly in the area of data privacy by leaving vulnerable individuals to the mercies of unrestrained profit-seeking. We need a collective response if we are going to put an end to the, to the digital strip search, as Shoshana Zuboff called it. We are entitled to have a say in how our society treats the weakest among us. We are entitled to innovations that serve us rather than making use of us. We are even entitled to spaces where no one tracks our behaviour. You do not need to have something to hide, to need a place where you are not watched. Thank you.